Good morning. This is Father Dennis Wild, Augustinian priest at Villanova University, and you see the beautiful backdrop of the chapel or our church here at the university, uh, which of course now is closed uh, because of course of the coronavirus. I'm also the associate director of Priests for Life and have been on the staff of Priests for Life for 22 years and enjoyed working with that wonderful organization. Reminding you of our website there is priestsforlife.org and you can find all sorts of subdivisions of websites on that once you get there. But one I want to draw your attention to is endabortion.tv. And there we stream live at 10 o'clock mass from Florida. Father Frank Pavone is doing that every day and it's beautiful to watch that. And at three o'clock, the Mysteries of the Rosary and at 3.30, Janet Marana speaks about a particular pro-life issue. So those are the backdrops of uh, both the church here, as you see, and also the technical area with the Priests for Life. I'd like to look at a passage today with you, and it struck me this morning as I was doing a little bit of meditating on the, the office, not the office so much, but the, uh, the first reading of the Mass today. Uh, we are, of course, on the Monday of the sixth week of Easter, and we're approaching the Feast of the Ascension, and of course then Pentecost, which will conclude all of the 50 days of Easter. However, this passage today uh, is a beautiful one. It's, a, it's kind of a down-to-earth one. It's not a very deep theological one, but it does bring some powerful messages to us. So let me read that. This is from Acts of the Apostles. Sailing from Troas, which was in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey today, uh, the west coast of Turkey, where it kind of gets into the Aegean Sea with all the islands there, but at Troas, we think of Troy, Helen of Troy, and of course the wooden horse of Troy and all that. That's the area that he's talking about. Sailing from Troas, we made a straight run for Samothrace. That's on the other side uh, in the Greece, Greek area up in Macedonia. The next day for Neapolis, which is not Naples, it's not uh, the same thing. Neapolis is another town on the north side of Greece. And from there for Philippi, Philip was named after Philip of Macedon, and his son was Alexander the Great, but that's in the northern part of Greece. Paul had already received that message in his dream of people beckoning him to come across the sea, and that was the invitation to evangelize Western Europe. So now we're crossing from the eastern part, which is Asia Minor, that's Turkey, or Israel, or Syria, which Paul had already been in. Now he's coming across He's beckoning, somebody's beckoning him to come across to evangelize them as well. So it was a Roman colony in the principal city of that particular district of Macedonia. We know of Macedonia today, it is northern Greece and parts of Bulgaria and even parts of former Yugoslavia. After a few days in this city, we went along the river outside the gates. Uh -huh. As it was the Sabbath, and this was a customary place for prayer. So they wanted to have the idea of being able to pray somewhere, and they were doing that. We sat down and preached to the women who had come to the meeting. So this was a gathering, and it was a kind of a Sabbath gathering. Again, Paul is looking at the Sabbath as a place, a time of honor to the Lord according to the commandment. We do know that early Christianity was... Um, was given us, uh, the, the Sabbath became a Sunday, because, not to say that the Sabbath became Sunday, but the Lord's Day was Sunday uh, because of the resurrection, because of Pentecost, those two pivotal issues, of pivotal uh, events in the uh, history of Christianity were so important that uh, that's when they gathered. So anyway, we sat down and preached to the women who had come to the meeting. One of these women was called Lydia a devout woman from the town of Thyatira who was in the purple dye trade. So very down to earth, very specific geographical areas, and not only that, but in their occupation, the, the work that she did. So she was a dyer, D-Y-E-R, and she was talking about purple dye. Now, purple, of course, uh, he brings that out because purple was a very difficult thing to get that particular type of uh, uh, color. And it was usually reserved or at least featured in the royalty. So this was not a cheap trade. This was something which was up there somewhat, upscale. So she sits down and listens. 
and she listened to us and the Lord opened her heart to accept what Paul was saying. Now, we're not even told that she's Jewish. Uh, we don't know that. We don't know whether she was uh, un, she's probably pagan, but we don't know. But she was Western. She was not in the East. Uh, she was not. Uh, so she was the first, um, the first convert of Christianity in Western Europe. Okay, in the West. So she opens her heart to accept what Paul was saying. Obviously, Paul was preaching about Jesus. You know, and just a few years before, he was, again, remember who he was. He was one who persecuted the Christians, and now he's preaching Jesus. After she and her household had been baptized, she sent us an invitation. So it wasn't the same afternoon, but she formally followed up on it. You know, a lot of times it will say, anyway, what she said was, if you really think me a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay with us. And she would take no refusal. So it wasn't just a kind of off the cuff, well, gee, I'm impressed by what you had to say. You've got to come to my house sometime. Uh, sometime that people invite us to, when they say sometime, it doesn't matter too much. If they give the date, then it matters because then they're really interested in following up on it. And so here, it wasn't just a question of saying something. She took the opportunity to send a messenger, to send a messenger, and she then invited them again. And it says, St. Paul says here, or rather St. Luke in the Acts of the Apostles, she said, come and stay with us, number one. And number two, she would take no refusal. So it wasn't just a haphazard thing. It wasn't just a nice off-the-cuff follow-up. This was something she persisted in because she was really moved by what St. Paul had to say, but she needed to know more. So you see the promptings of the Holy Spirit working here in her. This is very strong. The Holy Spirit is working within her and giving her the opportunity then to follow up on what St. Paul had already cultivated and sown the seed in her soul. So this is the backdrop of a Christian conversion. And it's something which sometimes takes place in the simplest of events. We don't have to get on a high horse or we don't have to, because he was knocked off a high horse, we think. Uh, certainly he was knocked down on the ground in his conversion to Damascus, right outside the city gates there. But no, St. Paul is doing something pretty normative, okay? Praying in the afternoon, and probably in a way which is really uh, effective, because it was, shows this. So she is the first convert, and I'm brought to the intention of this by, and I have to give credit, and I want to give credit to One Bread, One Body, courtesy of Presentation Ministries. Uh, and this is a, a, great, a great thing that I got on uh, the app, uh, Laudate. If you look at Laudate, uh, which is a wonderful app, APP, for the iPhone, and it probably is for Androids, I'm not sure, but it gives you so much information about the faith. And one of the things is this wonderful One Bread, One Body, which is, um, which is a uh, ministry, presentation ministries. You can get on there and you can find it. They do a wonderful job on it. And they take out from that passage of the Acts of the Apostles this one line, if you were convinced that I believe in the Lord, this is Lydia speaking now, the one who was in that industry of dyeing purple and so forth. If you are convinced that I believe in the Lord, come and stay at my house. You know, Jesus invited people to their house, his house. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down from the tree. The little man, remember, he's trying to see Jesus and he couldn't see him because he was so short. The crowd was so immense. So he goes up on a tree, the sycamore tree. What does Jesus say to him? He doesn't say, well, hey, how you doing there, Zacchaeus? He probably said that too, but he says, Zacchaeus, come down because I got to be in your house today. The Lord is coming to a house. When the Lord was in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, he was not allowed in a house. They tried to remember the inn, Christmas story, shifting gears from Easter to Christmas here, but before he was born, Joseph knocked on the door one after another in Bethlehem because they had to do the census and he had to come back to the place where his ancestry were from. And so he goes to Bethlehem and you know the story, of course, it's very, very common and very well known and loved. But on the other hand, we, we regret the fact that the world refused Jesus before he was born. He wasn't allowed into the inn. There was no room. There was no room for God. There was no room for Jesus in the inn. He was taken up by other people. 
So many times we think of that in our lives, we, we don't think we can fit God into the picture because of so much going on. And on a typical Sunday, not now, of course, it's very different, but on a typical Sunday, we've, oh, we got this game to play in the afternoon. We have to go visit that, and we have to go to that store. How many malls are open on Sunday that create traffic jams, but they don't create traffic jams at churches? Something to think about. And I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about the old normal, the normal that we have gotten used to, where the malls and the football games and the baseball games, and they're beautiful things, they're great things, I enjoy them myself, but taking over what Sunday's about. But getting back to the inn at Christmas, well, the Lord was not allowed into that inn, not because they were, you know, really refusing Christ. That wasn't what they were aware of, but simply God doesn't fit into the picture. So it's a very important thing to look at hospitality. See that Jesus himself was refused hospitality in the very beginnings of his life. But he goes to the house of Zacchaeus and he comes into Zacchaeus' house. Now can you imagine how beautiful that is? He didn't expect him, Zacchaeus didn't expect him to come in, but he was so happy about it. He says, now if I have offended people, I'm gonna give them double time, and three time, whatever he says over and over, he's gonna be very generous, that's the main point. But Jesus can do to the heart of people, but he came to his house, he came to his house. Jesus goes to many people's homes, and sometimes he's not accepted even as an adult, because he's looked at with raised eyebrows by the Pharisees and others who didn't like what he was doing. So we look at the hospitality that here is being offered to Paul. Lydia offers hospitality. And that is important because the first 300 years, as this very nice uh, Presentation Ministries uh, article points out, which I was reading this morning, for the first 300 years of Christianity, masses were offered in homes. It was the home that was the center of things. And that's why I think it's important to dwell on that a little bit today. Because we look at the home today, not as the home so much, but as a prison, right? That's what we're talking about. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Because COVID has knocked us into that situation of sequestering and being at home and not opening up. We hear all these terms and they take on new meanings and trends of thought. And yes, I do believe by the summer people are going to be really out there because it's going to get hotter and people are going to get onto the streets again. Hopefully we're going to do it in a very sensible way, but it's going to happen. There's no question about it. But for now, what do we see in our presence, in those four walls where we are, where you are right now? What kind of a home is it? Is it a home that is inviting? Is it a home that we're getting used to? Or is it just that, oh, I tolerate, I gotta be with my so-and-so? Well, I'm sure it isn't as crass as that. But a lot of times we can play down what the home really should be. The Lord has clearly given us a tremendous help here. And it's interesting that our home was a base for evangelization. You know, this is where Paul was able to evangelize further, not just Paul, but this example is given to us in the Acts of the Apostles for a reason. Not just that it was a nice Sunday afternoon gathering of sunny days, Sunday the afternoon, you know, with somebody else, and, you know, we have that nice. No, it was more than that. It was the opportunity to come to know the meaning of our life better by coming to the, know the source of our life in Jesus Christ. So that's what Paul has given us here. The domestic church is what we're talking about. And that's what the, the words of the Second Vatican Council tell us about, as well as the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The domestic church, the domestic church is the home. It's the place where we grow. It's the place where we should receive the seeds of our faith from the time that we're little tots, you know, that we can understand the meaning of mommy loves you, daddy loves you, and they're a reflection of the God who loves us infinitely. And so it's a beautiful thing to reflect on what we see in today's simple reading here. But you know, the Lord has clearly and repeatedly made the statement that the home is that foundation and central to Christianity. He's not only stated it, but he's also lived it. I gave a couple of examples, Zacchaeus, but not just the Zacchaeus example, the little man on the tree coming down, but also people that he's cured. He's gone to the houses of people. And we see that already in the New Testament in Israel, 
present-day Israel, then Palestine, but Peter would go to Joppa and visit people and cure them. This was put in in a very special way. The home was a resident area where things take place, and unexpected things can take place as well. If we make a problem into an opportunity, as this is, of course, with COVID-19, we look at it, we can look at it in different ways. But if we look at it as a problem, we're not going to solve what's happening in the home if there is some tension. Hopefully there isn't, but if there is, if we look at it as an opportunity, an opportunity for us to go beyond ourselves, here's what happens. So the Lord has clearly repeated, and he's made this central to Christianity, but consequently, Satan tries to destroy our homes. How? Through abortion, through contraception, promiscuity, unfaithfulness, and divorce. These are five words that this article I was reading this morning singles out. They're not the only by a long shot. There's also the distractions, the entertainments that we feel we need, the, the, the presents that we need to get, or the, the, the commodities that we feel that we need, or that our kids need, or whatever else. It goes on and on and on beyond the essential thing of coming to love one another. And saying love one another can be kind of trite at times too. You know, we can pass over that. What does that mean? It means sacrificing. It means giving up my wish for somebody else's. It means for the common good of peace in that community, which is the home, the domestic church, we need to give of ourselves. All of that, of course, is none. And when we do that, we don't surrender. We actually gain. We gain so much. But the devil wants us to separate. He wants us to divide. He attacks the home through the TV, the internet, and other forms of media. Satan makes it seem economically necessary to work away from home for most of our waking hours. Now we say, what are you talking about? We can't even get out of the house. That's true. But when we look at what we have done and what our job is about, are we perfect as to how we approach that? In other words, yes, it's for our family. Yes, it is the goods that we need to, uh, what we do, we, we work so that we can get the compensation and that we can provide for our family. All well and good and important and virtuous. But the way by which we go about our work, we need to look at as well. And the way by which we return to the home. I'm sure people, when they come back after a long day, they love to be in their home. How is that then taken? Comfort, yes, needed. Relaxing, needed, very much important. But also, what are we doing for the other? And so I have an opportunity to live with, um, well, actually 40 men here. It's a large community. And we interchange, we back and forth, we pray together, we have our meals together, we gather together, not so much these days, but we do gather. And it is beautiful to see how one man can help another person. And we're older, you know, we're older. The average age is, uh, well, pretty high in this community, and yet there's a lot that can be done even there. Let's remember that prayerfulness is very important. What's the most powerful thing we can do in the home? I believe it's prayer. I believe the attitude of prayer is the thing that can cultivate and give us a good sense of how we should respond and react and interchange with one another. The devil has been largely successful in getting meals, education, recreation, medical care, and business taken out of the home. How much of this has taken place today? You know, moving away from the home as the place by which people can find their final days. I can't get into a discussion and a debate as to who is available for that, who can take that, not only on the giving side, but on the taking side. But nonetheless, the home should be the first place to think of. Sometimes it's then, as this article says, relegated to a boarding house where residents merely sleep and entertain themselves. Well, today it's got to be more than a boarding house because that's where we're staying these days. But let's look at the old normal and in our own hearts see how can we better what we do at our home? How can we make that, entertain not, uh, that, how can we make that hospitality rather the center of what we do. Again, the church for 300 years before it was released by Constantine in 325 AD, or 313 I think it was, between that and 325, they were persecuted off and on, not always, but 
some terrible persecutions to the point where they wanted to just knock out all cities and uh, little villages that were Christian uh, and, and terrible persecution, persecutions. And so therefore they were not like in China today, like in China today. They're not able to, and in parts of Pakistan and Iran and other places, if they're Christians, they're, they're not free. They're not free. And it's interesting that these countries that are uh, problematic with us on an economic scale are also problematic on a human rights scale as well. Problematic is a very mild word. They're evil. They're evil. But we can pray for the evil as well to change. We can pray for the Lord to change the hearts. That's why prayer is so important. All the arguing, argue, argumentation that we might be able to help hold between these peoples may not go anywhere but we can pray to the Lord to change the hearts of people. Yes, but in China and all these places, you have to be underground. Underground, that's the only place. And look at our history of Christianity. Look in England in the 16th and 17th century, and in Ireland, because they took over Ireland, had to go underground. If you were a priest, you were put to death if you came to England. All of this we forget about. We live in a situation today where what we're doing in our homes people talk about as being like an in prison. No, it's not. It's something that can cultivate, something that is hospitality. But we need to pray for those people around the world that do not have the opportunity to share their faith together in a free way. And such as it is in places like China, Pakistan, and Iran, because those latter two places are, of course, uh, Islamic, uh, um, pretty much uh, Islamic countries in the sense that they are controlled by that. The home is relegated to a boarding house, so I hope it isn't. By the power of the risen Christ and with wisdom from the Holy Spirit, let us restore our homes to their crucial place in God's plan of salvation. The little touch of prayer on a Sunday, well, in the Sabbath afternoon, that Paul and his companions were praying, and the way it touched the heart of Lydia, because God touched their heart. It wasn't Paul, it was God who, through the instrumentality of Paul praying, touched the heart of this pagan. We don't know if she's a pagan or Jew, but she was not Christian, and she was the first convert. And so what happened in that house afterwards was a confirmation of what she had already received, and she was baptized in her family along with her. This is the way it went. Thousands and thousands of time multiplied in the first 300 years of Christianity until the point where the Roman Empire could see that Christians loved one another, see how they love one another, and see how they're willing to die for one another as well in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And today we're called to some dire things because, you know, in the womb there isn't the hospitality we should have. One out of four children do not see the light of day. Children. Yes, that's what they are in the womb, regardless of how young they are. It could be a couple of seconds or it could be the nine months. After fertilization, after conception, it is a human being. Ain't no question about that. It is not going to be anything else but a human being. We may not know the gender right away, but we do know that it is human. We don't know how long it's going to live afterwards for that matter, but it is human. And this is what we have to recapture, the hospitality for the unborn, big time losers today because of a culture that is inhospitable. There's no room for Jesus in the inn and there's less room for those in the womb because people have decided that they're going to make their choice and not the choice of God's plan. It's a horrible thing. We need to address this and we need to change it. And one of the ways we change is by voting and we must vote pro-life. Because when we vote pro-life, it carries with it other virtuous things as well. It helps the economy because there are more people now in the workplace than there would have been if we eliminate them in the womb, and on and on and on. But whatever it is, the attitude of hospitality to let them grow. God's love is for all, the just and the unjust. He loves all. He doesn't measure how he loves by whether person does a good or does evil. He wants us to do good, and he's going to reward us for good, and he's going to punish us for doing evil. There's no question about that, but that's not where we should be. 
we should recognize that even those people who are misguided at least, and maybe holding on to their misguidedness, you know, which is worse, even they can convert and they can find the solace and the hospitality and the love of other Christians. Let us be hospitable beginning with our home, beginning with those we love right here, but also let us extend that hospitality through prayerfulness and inviting the Lord to bless those who are in greater need. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is Father Dennis Wild, Augustinian priest and Associate Director of Priests for Life. God bless you.